says in verse 20, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He says, I didn't hide the truth from you. I gave you all of the truth. He says, uh, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. He says, we went from door to door, from house to house, and we're teaching the truth we want everybody to know. Verse 21, testifying both of the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repent means to change your mind. He says, we told the same thing to everybody. It didn't matter if you were a Jew or a Greek. It was the same gospel to everybody. It's the same message to everybody. Change your mind about who God is and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not through keeping the law, keeping the Sabbath, as Brother Chad touched on this morning. It's not through obeying commandments. The only thing you can do to go to heaven is to trust in Jesus that He paid for your sin. It's finished. It's done. So he testified this everywhere he went. The same message to everybody. He didn't have to custom tailor and change it for each individual. Although everybody's different, we all have the same problem. We're sinners. And the good news, the gospel is, Jesus loves us so much. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he wants you to take the gift. Do you have the gift? He says in verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit. That sounds kind of rough, right? But none of these things moved me. He says, Now I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. So first, there were these tears and temptations then he says god's revealing to me when i get to jerusalem uh, there's bonds and afflictions if you know the story through acts as you're reading through it everywhere he would go people would say stop don't go to jerusalem they're going to kill you they're going to do this to you they're going to do that and yet when he got there that's exactly what they did they beat him up and falsely accused him and they were trying to kill him i mean quite a thing and paul knows this and yet he said none of these things move me he says, I have a course in life. I know where I'm going. You know, the Bible says that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. If you're saved, you're in Christ, you have an eternal destination in heaven. One day you're going to look like Him in the resurrection. So I know what my destination is. That's already determined. He's made a promise and God can't lie. So knowing where I'm going... What is it that I need to do with my time while I'm here? He said, none of these things move me. You can't convince me. You can beat me up and take my freedom and hurt my body and it doesn't matter. I know where I'm going and nothing can change that. Nothing on earth can change my destination. None of these things move me from the course that I'm on while I'm alive. I know that I have a path. I need to walk with God. None of these things move me. That's what he says in verse 24, but none of these things move me. I have to ask you, would tears and temptations or bonds and afflictions, would that move you? It didn't Paul. He, he was a great example for us. Let me ask you this. Let's take a step back. Did 2019, did that move you? How about 2020? Boy, we had a really weird year in 2020. You guys know what I'm talking about? I, I mean, I call, I call COVID the universal excuse. The people that didn't want to go to church, they didn't go to church. The people that didn't want to go to work, they didn't go to work. The ones that didn't want to hang out with their family on Christmas or Thanksgiving, they didn't hang out with their family, right? It was the universal excuse. Boy, if I want to get out of anything, all I got to do is say those magical words, right? More like witchcraft words. Anyway, uh, did, did, did COVID-19, did it move you? Did the flu, did it move you? Did the, did the vax mandates and the shutdowns and the lockdowns in 2020, did that move you? Did it get you off course from where God wants you to go? Did it mess with you and just uh, offend you and take you out of where God has for you? What about 2021? Things began to look up, it seemed. 2022, still an odd year. 2023, did that move you? 
I know some people last year, boy, it was such a plenteous year for them that it moved them right out of the way of God's will and now they're distracted with the cares of this world. How about 2024? Will you let that move you? Or will you let this be your vision and say, I know who I am and who I belong to and where I'm going. God has given me a mission and a purpose in life and I see the path, I see the vision clearly. Now that I know that, it doesn't matter what the world throws at me. It doesn't matter what the devil tries to do. None of these things will move me. It's good to determine in your heart, I'm going to serve God for the whole year. It's good. It's good to set goals and have plans and decide right now. Have you not seen the news lately, Pastor Fannin? You don't know what you're talking about. Wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and earthquake in diverse places. I mean, I mean, it's pretty bad out there. Haven't you seen? Did, did any of that move you? Is it moving you now where you say, oh, it's going to be horrible. We're not going to be able to do anything. There's famine out there. Didn't you hear? Listen, don't let any of these things move you, offend you, and get you out of the will of God. If you want to have a 2024 vision, you'll say, what stuff? I'm not worried about that. What about my job? What about the economy? You hear what's going on in the stock market? Or you just don't know. I've got family problems that you don't understand. Are you going to let family problems move you from serving God? You know, if you're saved and you have brothers and sisters in, that are not saved, or family that's not saved, they don't understand you. But it's your job to help them understand who Christ is. Don't let your family move you. You need to move them and get them closer to the Lord. Here's a hard one. What about, what about Bible preaching? Did that move you? Has that offended you? Was there something you saw in the Bible or heard out of the Bible? Is there some doctrine that offends you or moves you? I mean, I, I told you this lady stopped when she wanted to come visit the church and she says, well, now you're not going to preach on drinking, are you? So what kind of preacher would I be if I didn't tell you that the Bible says not even to look at the wine, don't drink the wine, you're commanded to be sober and not drunk? Of course I'm going to preach against drinking. God forbid I would endorse somebody doing something that would hurt them. So does that offend you that I preach against drunkenness that destroys lives? You know how many lives have been ruined by drunks on the road or people have just ruined their families because they want to stay drunk and they're not sober, they're not there in the moment, and they're filled with another spirit instead of God's Holy Spirit? What about covetousness? Oh, you're not going to preach against stuff, are you? I mean, we all need stuff. I'm just saying don't covet and desire and lust after things that don't belong to you. Don't do it. Don't let your heart be uh, just getting joy from wanting more stuff. We had somebody last year and they, they quit coming to the church because I preached on nakedness. The Bible warns us that certain parts of your body should only be shared in the marriage relationship and, and they were moved because they felt like they should be able to share their body with the world and they were offended at that. And I had no agenda of trying to offend anyone, but I'm commanded to, counsel, to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. And if it's in here, we need to talk about it. And we're going to go through the Bible and eventually we're going to touch on every subject. There was somebody I know, and they got offended that I would dare to say to cover up your body and to dress modestly and don't dress immodestly. You understand when somebody shows off their body with the intention of causing others to lust, that they're in sin. Just as much as the person that goes out of their way to stare at somebody's body, they're in sin also. I mean, this is something that we need to hear in the church. Does that, does that move you? Does that offend you? That I would tell you husbands, hey, don't let your wife share her body with everybody else. That's yours. Keep it for yourself. What about greed? Stuff. What about weed? There's one that offends often. You're preaching against weed. God wouldn't make a law against a plant, would he? Well, let's turn to Genesis. He actually did uh, make a law about eating a certain plant, right? You understand, God wants us to be sober-minded. 
I don't want to offend you. I want you to know the truth. There are Bible doctrines we need to hear so that we can be better Christians. Uh, church is not just an opportunity for a motivational sermon. You're doing a good job. Just keep going. Hey, amen to that. But some of us aren't doing a good job and we need to be reproved and corrected and instructed and pointed in the right direction for God's glory so that we can be conformed unto the image of His Son and begin to grow up in the fullness of the stature of Christ so that He can see us and say, hey, you're starting to look more like a Christian in your life. Don't you want God to look at you and say, well done, you're growing. It's God's will for our life. But many people get offended at Bible preaching. Does it offend you that I preach against Halloween? That I tell you that there is a holiday that the Satanists love and they brag that they can trick Christians into worshiping the devil for one night. And I dare say, well, the Bible says if people uh, dress up like devils and do these things, all of a sudden, you know, they're possessed. I mean, th- I mean, that's sinful. And I'm saying, hey, don't do it. Don't be part of that. Come out from among them and be ye separate. And it's like, oh, come on. What next? What holiday are you going to get next? Well, I mean, holiday, holy day. Do we really want a holy day called Halloween? That's hell's holy day, unholy day. Are you moved that I would preach about the things in the world and just warn you and try to wake you up? I mean, I know one person I offended because I dared to say, if you watch football on Sunday morning, or Sunday afternoon instead of going to church, you've made it an idol over God. They say, oh, that's it, I'm done, I can't stand this. You can preach against drinking and you can preach against the Muslims, but don't touch my football. Does that offend you? Does that move you? What does it take to move you out of the will of God? How about warmongering? Didn't Jesus say, blessed be the... Jesus said, blessed be the... Peacemakers. Now, we have this tendency because we live in America where apparently there's only two parties, Democrat or Republican. And I can give you a hundred reasons I'll never be a Democrat, right? So I'm a very conservative person, but the Republicans are known for starting wars and, and... supporting wars and warmongering and we need to buy more bombs we need to drop more bombs we need to pick more enemies and hey are we in this country yet let's get over there and let's get them before they get us i call that bullying that's not peacemaking and i know hey that may offend you and move you and i don't do it because i have a bone to pick with you i want you to know the truth that there's a blessing when in your heart you can be at peace with even your enemies Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. He'll make even your enemies be at peace with you when you're walking in the fear of the Lord. I'd rather have peace all of my days than war. Those that love war, I mean, look out. Here's another one. Does it offend you that I preach against this idol? Uh Uh-oh. Does it offend? I mean, because when I was growing up as a Baptist, it was like, they called it the one-eyed God. Anybody ever hear that in a sermon? Yeah. The one-eyed God, the TV. We sit down and we, we just we go into a trance and we believe whatever it says, right? Well, now everybody's been issued their own personal copy. Here's your God. These be thy gods, O Israel, right? And here's the problem. Man, you can use this for good. I get that. You can use it for communication. You can learn things. I, I get all that. I, I'm a computer guy. I'm a nerd. But I'm here to tell you as a Christian, and more importantly as a preacher, don't let this rule your life. Don't let this be so distracting that during the preaching, you're like, oh, well, let me see what's on on Instagram, or maybe I'll play some Bejeweled while I'm I'm still listening. I, I can do two things. No, you can't. No, you can't. You're fracturing your mind. We have allowed the cell phone and media, uh, this consumption of this information to just overwhelm us and literally move us from who we are. You understand that when you see that stuff, it goes down in your heart and it changes how you think. It causes you to be tolerant to sin that God said we should stay away from. It causes us to change our philosophy of life. It causes us us to covet after things and stuff and people. It it really does affect our heart. Does it move you that I, I warn you about the cell phone? Does that offend you? Or do you understand and agree and say, you know what, maybe we do need to stay away. Maybe, maybe there's others we could help also and warn them. There are many doctrines that we should teach in church. The duty of the church is to preach Bible doctrine. That's what the local church really is all about. We need to teach Christ and Him crucified and the whole council and every commandment that's in here. And we need to learn how to look more like Christ every single day. We ought to have clean living and we ought to forgive one another even when they don't deserve it. 
We need to be hu humble. Humble. We need to have humility. Human nature is to think we're better than somebody else and look down on them and gossip about them and belittle them and find reason to talk about them. And then in the church, you know what we do? We say, oh, well, did you hear about brother so-and-so? Uh, pray for him. Uh, let me share the gossip. And we use prayer as a disguise to talk about people. And that's wicked. We need to really care about people and love them and see ourselves as who we are, as someone that's wretched and a sinner and we don't deserve heaven, but thank God He's given us the gift and now we need to serve others as Christ served us. What about Bible reading? When I preach about Bible reading, does it bother you? Does it move you? Oh, there he goes again, talking about reading the Bible. Just leave us alone, Pastor. What about soul winning? What about preaching the Gospel? Today at 2 o'clock we're going to meet right here and we're going to gather together and we're going to go out and we're going to preach the gospel to some people and I'm asking that the Lord would help us to find somebody that wants to be saved. We often find people that are already saved that need encouragement or need to be told, hey, there is a pillar and ground of truth. There is a local church here that wants to help each other and pray for each other. We're here to help. We go out soul winning and soul warning, if you will, and we warn them if they reject Christ, there's hell to pay. What would it take to get you out of church? What would move you? What's the cost? A million dollars? Not me. Not for a million dollars. Boy, just like Peter, he was quick to say, not me, Lord, I'll always be careful. What would get you out of church? What would get you out of reading your Bible? What would get you out of uh, preaching the gospel? Here he says in Acts 20, look at verse 19, he says, tears and temptations. If you went through a season of your life that the easiest way to describe it, oh man, let me tell you, 2019 for me, it was nothing but tears and temptations. They were lying in wait to destroy me. It was horrible. Would that move you away from serving the Lord? Would that offend you? Would you fall out? What did he say in verse 23? Bonds and afflictions. Somebody's going to lock you up and hurt you physically. Would, would that be enough that you would say, I quit, I'm done. I don't want any more of the Christian life. Leave me out of this. Would you give up and be offended and move? But none of these things moved me. One of my favorite verses in 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 3 and 4, it tells us, it says, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Stuff is going to happen in your life, but you have Christ and He's greater than this life. He says that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. He says you're appointed unto affliction. Verse 4, the next verse, he says, For verily, when we were with you before, we told you that ye should suffer tribulation. Did you know that the Christian life is an appointment with suffering and tribulation? Yeah, bonds and trials and tribulations and afflictions and tears and grief. The Lord Jesus Christ, the prophecy of His death, burial, and resurrection in Isaiah 53, it tells us that He was a man acquainted with grief. Real close to it. Good friends. What a statement. God's will is that we would grow. Look at Acts 20, verse 24. He says, but none of these things moved me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. And here's the problem. We count our life as numero uno. I'm the best. I'm the most important. Everything that I do matters. And then everybody else can fall under me somewhere else way below. That's just human nature. I'm not reading your mind or looking into your secrets. You're a human being, so I know how it is. I struggle with the same things as you. Uh, we want to be proud instead of be humble. It takes work to be humble. But he says, neither count I my life dear unto myself. He's not self-loathing or hating or devaluing life. He's not like, oh me, oh my, it's all just horrible. I hate myself. That's not what he's saying here. What he's doing is he's finding the spiritual value in the time that he has now. We have very little time on earth, and it's an investment into eternity. God will reward us one day, and we have to walk by faith and believe that, and trust in that, and work for Him. Did you, know, did you guys know that investments are expensive? Did you, know, did you ever think about that? 
Well, I know a guy, and he made a million dollars. He started investing in something, and next thing you know, whoop, it went way up. And it's like, you know, you didn't get there just by, you didn't, there's no cheat code for that. There's no easy button for that. Investments are expensive. It takes hard work. It takes sweat and tears, and it takes uh, you have to sacrifice and eat some rice so you can put some money in something to see it grow eventually in the future. Uh, investments are expensive, and what he's doing here, he's saying, neither did I count my life dear unto myself. He says, I'm investing my time now in the spiritual investment. I'm sacrificing my fleshly time and my fleshly desire and my priorities here for an eternal reward from the Lord. He's seeing the true spiritual value of things. Investing our life now in the work of the Lord. There is a great eternal reward. If you would, go to Matthew 10. Go to Matthew chapter 10. When he says, neither count I my life dear unto myself, he's talking about a gospel that's worth dying for. Would you die for the gospel? Now wait a minute, the gospel is eternal life, it's free, Jesus did all the hard work, I don't have to die, he died for me, amen. But would you die for the gospel? Or maybe here's the question, would you live for the gospel now while there's time? Would you live for Him while you can? That's the 2024 vision. Would you lay down your life and serve Him? If I told you, if I could prove to you, and I showed you, and I said, now listen, the only way that you can avoid going to an eternal hell is you have to die a martyr's death. You have to be put to death for Jesus Christ and the gospel. That's the only way you can go to heaven. You have to die here. Well, we would probably be willing to die to avoid eternal hell, wouldn't we? Would you die for the gospel? If you would, then here's the real question. Will you live for it now? Will you see things with this vision, this eternal perspective? If I would give it all, my life, to not go there, to go there, why don't you just live for Him now? Why don't you? Yeah, it's a much better deal, isn't it? Boy, I like free gifts. I love free gifts. Amen. Well, so Jesus knows that. That's why he said, Don't worry. I did all the hard work. I paid for this one for you. I want you to take it as a free gift. So, wait a minute. If the gospel's free, if salvation is free, forgiveness of sins is called a free gift in Romans 6 and Ephesians 2. So, if it's totally free, then God should pay me for my work, shouldn't He? And He will. And that's His promise. I can't work for salvation. I work for rewards. I'm investing in the future. I'm investing in my retirement, if you will. That's my retirement plan. Matthew chapter 10. I want you to see this. This is awesome. Uh, Matthew 10. Look at verse 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You know what he's saying? When you finally figure out that you're never going to be satisfied or have true joy by chasing the stuff in this world, chasing the pleasures of this world, and you figure out that true joy comes from God, and you die to yourself, and you pick up your cross, and you become a disciple of Christ, and you say, I'm going to work for Him the rest of my time. He says, then you really find your life. You find out who you are. You find your true purpose. You find true joy and satisfaction. Uh, in this chapter, I, I want you to see this back up a little bit. Go to uh, verse 28. Again, it speaks of losing your life in verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body. Well, that's pretty cool. Don't be afraid of somebody physically hurting you. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. If a robber walked in and put a gun to my head and say, I'm going to kill you. What, are you going to threaten me with eternity? You can't take my soul. You can't take my salvation. That was a gift from God. He says, don't be afraid of them, 
but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He says you need to fear God. Don't fear the robber. Don't fear the Muslims. Don't fear the Chinese. Don't fear the Russians. Because hasn't that been the war drum? Oh no, they're going to come get us. Be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. Well, they can't take my soul. And I'm called to live for God. So I'm not going to give in to that nonsense. I'm going to focus on the Lord. And I'm going to fear God who can take my body like that. And he can take my soul as well. He owns it. He gave the soul and it's going back to him for judgment. Notice he says in verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. God's, God controls everything, but he won't control your heart and, and force you to choose him. He says the birds that are in the air, you need to eat. He's going to let one of those birds fall to the ground so you can catch it and have a meal. Back then, apparently, they ate little birds, too. I think today we call them chicken nuggets, right? <laughs> There's not a lot of meal there. To me, it seems like a whole lot of work to get a couple bites, right? Uh, maybe that's where you're burning energy to get to it. I don't know. Uh, but God controls that. He knows about those birds, but he knows about you, and that's his point. Verse 30, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Did you know that? There are a certain number of hairs on your head, uh, some of us less than others. But still, there's a number. There are hairs on your head. Maybe they're all on your neck and the rest are gone. I don't know. Not picking on the bald, right? But think about it. You don't know how many hairs are on your head. You don't have to keep up with that. God knows how many, how long, how thick, what their natural color was before the chemicals got involved. All right, I'll leave that one alone. I'm going to get in trouble. But God knows everything there is to know about you, and he loves you, and he cares for you. He says in verse 31, Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. If he knows about those birds, and some he lets fall to the ground, and others he keeps safe so that they can preserve life and reproduce sparrows, God takes care of the sparrows. He takes care of you. That's the good news. You're of much more value than a whole bunch of sparrows. Verse 32 is interesting. He says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. This is not speaking of your redemption. This is speaking of your reward. When you preach the gospel and mention Jesus to other people, there's an eternal reward. And when you do it, Jesus says, yes, Father, reward them for that. And when you don't do it, not, no reward there. Look at the next verse, verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now, wait a minute. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and he did come and bring peace. He did. It says he did. So what does this mean? In the parallel to this, in Luke 2, or 12 rather, it says he came to bring division. That's separation. Jesus said, it's so controversial that I'm coming claiming to be God. Those that claim to be of God are going to reject me and there's going to be a separation in your house, in your family, at work, with your friends. The name of Jesus divides, doesn't it? Aren't there some people, I was talking to a guy this past week and, and we started talking about it and he loosely sort of names the name of Jesus and he's trying to figure it out and he's got half the truth but not all of it, I'm trying to give it to him. And there comes a point in the conversation, he did one of these, he just took his sunglasses and went down and he's checking out. He doesn't want to look me in the eyes as we talk about who Jesus is. Jesus divides, that name divides. It's like a sword that will cut through things spiritually. Verse 35, look at this. He says, For I am come to set a man at variance. That means in opposition of. I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Wait a minute. Because of Jesus, I'm going to have enemies in my house? Yeah. Someone's going to say, I can't believe you, you think salvation is without any works and it's all on Jesus. I have to be a good person to get there. That creates division and separation. It calls enmity. Your foes are in your household. He that loveth, look at verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
God wants you to love your children and respect your parents and care for everybody else in your life. But he says, wait a minute, if you're going to disrespect Jesus for the sake of your family, shame on you. If you're more willing to offend your family with the name of Jesus, not to hurt them, but to tell them the truth. I know they don't want to hear it. I know they don't believe like this. I know they think all religion is evil, but I have to tell them the truth. I've discovered it. Jesus is God and He died for all of our sins. And if I don't tell you, you're going to go to hell. That's true love in your family. And he's trying to say, there are people in your family, maybe your son, maybe your daughter, maybe a spouse, maybe a brother or a sister or a co-worker, where you know when you name the name of Jesus, it's like putting a sword in the room and it just, it's like, ah, division. I don't want to hear that. You know I don't care. The name of Jesus is powerful and He's the one that forgave you of your sins. Will you allow Him to work through you so you can tell your family only Jesus saves, maybe you can save them from hell. Maybe they'll say, well, I, I mean, they really are different. I noticed something. Maybe they'll say, well, Dad always said religion was fake, but now he believes in Jesus and he's preaching it to me. And the Holy Spirit will work through you as you speak to them and it will prick their heart. They may act offended and not talk about it, but you know, one day they're going to come back to that and say, Dad told me this was true and I needed to hear it and I'm glad I heard it from Dad or Mom or brother or sister. Will you stand up for the name of Jesus? That's what we're called to do. Or is that one of those things that would move you? You want me to confess Jesus before my family? What, what kind of deal is this? I didn't know it was going to be like that. Verse 38, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Can you imagine Jesus carried his own cross to his own death? And he says, hey, you want to be my disciple? You want the fullness of my power on your life? Great. Die to yourself. Uh, he says, don't count your life here of any value. Your value is there. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Pick up your cross. It's a death sentence. I'm going to die to the flesh daily so I can serve God. He says in verse 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. When you lose your life in this world and figure it all out, aha, I finally figured it all out. Uh, go to Matthew 16, just a few passages ahead. Matthew chapter 16. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Matthew 16, this is where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he said to his disciples, he's, he gave them the keys to the kingdom of God and he told them, go build my kingdom by getting people saved. If you would look at verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. He's kind of saying you'll find yourself. Uh, if you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. While you're going there, let me ask you this question. What is our goal in life? What is our purpose in life? Well, he said, if I lose my life, I'll find my purpose in Christ. In Acts 20, our key verse, he said, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Here's my next point and one of the final ones. We're almost done, but think about this. So that I might finish my course with joy. When you cross the threshold of death, and you're going to be aware of all of it, your spirit will be aware. And you realize as you're departing, oh man, I wish, I wish I had only done things differently. Are you going to finish well? Are you going to finish with joy? In 1 Corinthians 9, let me get there with you. Look at verse 22, please. 
to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Paul said, I died to myself and my personality and my preference, and I didn't talk about my sports team, and I didn't talk about my favorite dish, and I didn't talk about my favorite city and my best vacation. I talked about Christ. And I wanted to relate with everybody I could and help them understand how Christ needs to be in their life. And He's always been there. He is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The problem is men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And when you show up with the gospel and you shine that light in their heart, it's a wake-up call. That's what Paul was doing and he's trying to tell us to do the same thing. By saving some, he says, verse 23, And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. You know what he's saying there? He's not just saying, everybody that's running, everybody's running. He's saying, when you decide to get in the race, you do it with all that you have. Do we have any runners in here? Ish. (laughs) Ish. All right. (laughs) If you are a professional runner, if you got the bug and you decided tomorrow, that's it, 2024, I'm going to run this year. Boy, you're going to get the right shoes. You're going to do the right exercises. You're going to get the right nutrition. You're going to get the right sleep. All the tools, you're going to read about it. You're going to get magazines about it. I mean, you're going to be, you're going to be all in is what he's saying. Oh, you're going to run the race for Christ? Then why don't you go all in because there's an end of that race coming and if you want to achieve the prize if you want to get the goal if you want to make it across the finish line do you know how many people don't finish a race literally physically because they didn't hydrate they don't have electrolytes they picked the wrong shoes they didn't practice enough and keep their body disciplined in preparation for this end of the race well i don't want to be a loser at the end of my life i want to be a winner with christ Look what Paul's saying here. He says, uh, again in verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And there's the admonition. He says, so run. I mean, if you're going to run, then run and do it with all you've got. He says, run so that you may obtain. God is giving you a commandment to work for Him while you're here because there's a reward up there. He's saying have a desire of eternal spiritual blessings from God. He says, go and get it. Run with all you've got. So run. Verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. You know what he's saying? Striving is working for the mastery to be the best. Temperate, you're disciplined in all things. The guy that's serious about running, you won't catch him eating a Big Mac at lunchtime. He'll be the one that'll say, no, I can't because I'm running a race. Oh, I can't do that. It'll slow me down and I might not win that race. He says, Now they do it to obtain a corruptible, as he uses that illustration of running. They're, hey, I got a prize, I got a trophy, I got a little crown. He says, but we, an incorruptible. We're going to be given a new name when we get to heaven, it'll be on our forehead. We're going to get a crown as a reward in a sense, and it's almost like that will be our countenance and our appearance. And when I see you in heaven, I'll know what you did on the earth when I look you in the face. That's how Jesus is going to reward us in eternity. I'll see it in your crown, in your face, on your head. That's how the Lord's going to reward. He says, we have an incorruptible crown. Look at verse 26. I therefore, and here he says it again, so run. So run. Not as uncertainly. I'm not running all over. I know where I'm going. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest... That by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He says, I don't want to be kicked out of the race. I control my body. I don't want to sin against the Lord and do a sin unto death where God will kill me and take me home early. I don't want the weight and the bondage of sin to ruin my life so that I can't run this race for God because I see the end. If you would, go to 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, and we'll finish there. As you're going there, let me read to you in Philippians where he says, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. 
I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God has a high calling for you. He has a high standard for you. He has a great ministry for you. And he wants you to see it and reach for it. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse number 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. I say this often because I think it's important for you to understand, if you're a Christian, you have a ministry. If you're saved, you have a ministry. It's not just me up here. It's not just those that play music or lead or serve or feed. It's everybody has a ministry to minister, to serve others for the gospel's sake. Verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul says, I'm done. I finished the course. I'm ready to go. I crossed the line. I'm out of here. Let me give you a few things before I go. Henceforth, look what he says. Oh, no, I'm sorry, verse 7. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them that also love his appearing. Go back to Acts 20. Go back to Acts chapter 20 and we'll finish there. Uh, Paul is telling us, I know there's a race and I know there's a finish line. The Lord let me know when I was done. You have a last day here. I pray that you get all of your spiritual work done before the last day. I really believe that the majority of Christians don't finish their spiritual work. But they finish the physical. We got the house. We got the car. We got the retirement. But they forgot to do the spiritual work. Finally, in Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy, look, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. God has given you a ministry. Look at it. Look what it says. He says, finish the course and the ministry to testify the gospel. There are people that you can get saved by opening your mouth and telling them about Jesus. There are some people, you're not going to have time to get them saved, but you just need to preach Jesus to them while you can. That's your purpose. That's our goal in life. He's telling us here, teach others about the free gift. Do you understand this, guys? The, the Bible is the most important thing you can say. This God's Word is the most powerful thing that can come out of your mouth. It's more brilliant than you'll ever be. There's more wisdom in a few words of God than everything you could write your whole life. The most powerful spiritual thing you can ever do is open your mouth and quote a verse to somebody. What power! I know you may feel intimidated and say, Pastor Fannin, I'm not like you. I don't, I don't have a desire to go knock doors every day and preach the gospel every day. And I don't, I don't like talking to strangers. And I don't have all the Bible knowledge. It's not about wisdom of words. It's not about my head knowledge. Let me tell you something. It's about the Spirit of God working through you when you humble yourself and let Him work and say, Oh God, help me work for you. And you show me what to say to them. And let me tell you a computer analogy, just like a computer, your brain is a hard drive. Your heart has a little database and the needles are moving. And it says, what files can I access to serve someone else? And here you go. Get this in your mind, get it in your heart, get it in your life and let the Holy Spirit speak through you. The greatest thing you can do with your life is open your mouth and say, this is what Jesus said. God so loved the world. God so loved... Hey, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And He didn't just die for the good. Because there are none good. No, not one. There are none righteous. We've all failed. We're all sinners. God, knowing that, loves us. And you know how you got saved? 
someone opened their mouth and they opened their Bible and maybe it didn't happen one time. Maybe your mama planted those seeds for years in your heart. And then one day God sent a stranger or a friend and they said, let me, let me connect some dots. Let me just share the power of this with you. And while they were reading the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit was stirring up your spirit. And you're like, I get it. I get it. It's all by faith. I don't have to be a good person. I, nobody's good enough to go to heaven. Thank God He saves us through Jesus Christ. And the most powerful thing you can do is read this or say this to someone else. You want to be important in this world? Die to your selfishness. Live for Christ. Preach the Word of God to others. Be uh, unmovable. None of these things move me. Be faithful to the end. Be a witness of the truth of the Gospel. And God will bless you this year. That's my vision for this year. I would ask you to take this verse home with you. It is on your bulletin this morning. It's printed on that bulletin. Put it on the fridge. Uh, get you a 3 by 5 card and write it out this week and think about each step of what this verse is saying and say, this is God's vision for me personally this year. I see it and I want to do it. I want to preach Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I love you and I'm so thankful for what you're doing here. Lord, I just ask that you would help us to get better about talking about you. Lord, I ask that you would help us to take this challenge to get your word in our heart and in our mouth for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.